Hi, everyone. I'm Pratyush, and I'm here to talk about Zexi, which is a system for constructing, uh, enabling users to do private computation on decentralized ledgers. Okay. This is joint work with Sean from Zcash, my advisor, Alessandro, Matt Green at JHU, Ian at Cornell Tech, and um, Howard from many of us at Berkeley. Okay. So today, if users want to compute on, uh, conduct general computations on distributed ledgers, they have a number of options, such as Ethereum, Tezos, EOS. And the common factor amongst all of these systems is that they usually work by re-execution. What this means is that when there's a transaction that's broadcast to the network, every user or every node in that network has to re-execute the computation inside the transaction and ensure that the results match before the transaction can be appended to the ledger or blockchain. Now, this has implications for the scalability and privacy of the system. From the scalability perspective, the issue is that your network probably contains a number of different nodes which have different computing capabilities. If all of these nodes have to re-execute the same computation, then you're basically bottlenecked by the weakest node in your system. And this is an issue which persists even if you have an ideal ledger and like the best consensus mechanism in the world. Okay, from the privacy perspective, the issue is that this transaction reveals who executed the program, uh, sorry, what program was executed, what was, the what was the data that was input to the program, and who invoked the smart contract or the transaction. And anyone can see this for all time because this transaction will be stored permanently on the ledger. So in this talk, I'll show you how to um, fix these issues, focusing mainly on privacy because there's been a lot of work that has uh, tried to fix a scalability issue. And as we'll see, uh, fixing privacy also as a corollary fixes some of these scalability issues. In more detail, in Zexi, what we do is construct a ledger-based system that enables users to conduct computations offline and then publish transactions that attest to the correctness of these computations. From a, pri from a privacy perspective, what we get is that the resulting transaction reveals no information about the offline computation. We get succinctness, which means that the resulting transactions are uh, very tiny, short in size, and can be verified efficiently. Concretely, for reasonable parameter sizes, we get transactions that are less than a kilobyte and can be verified in less than 50 milliseconds. From a, fun from a functionality perspective, we can support arbitrary user-defined functions uh, while still isolating malicious functions from honest ones so that they don't affect the execution of honest functions, while allowing um, <coughs> these functions to communicate in a secure manner. Okay. Finally, we also show how to apply the system to construct some example applications, such as private user-defined assets, and then we extend these to private stable coins. And finally, we show how to uh, trade these custom assets via private decentralized exchanges. Okay, so that's our paper, Zexi. In this talk, I won't really go into the, general, the generality of Zexi as a whole, but instead, I'll show you how we can use ideas from Zexi to construct two applications, namely private user-defined assets and private decentralized exchanges. Okay. And this is mostly in the interest of time and the fact that a concrete application is easier to explain. All right. Why digital assets or user-defined assets? Well, one can argue that these are maybe the only successful application of smart contract systems that we know of today. And uh, so if, we can, if our system can support these, we're already supporting uh, real-world useful uh, applications. But also it's the case that there's a bewildering variety of tokens in the world today. There's like ERC20 tokens, there's ERC721 tokens, there's stable coins which have custom policies to comply with regulations. And so if, we, if our protocol can support these different kinds of assets which have different properties with respect to transaction flow and controlling authorities and stuff, then we have some reasonable confidence that our system is relatively expressive. Okay, so let's say we have these kinds of digital assets. Users probably want to trade these assets, right? How do they do this today? Well, the most popular mechanism is to use centralized exchanges. And in these, what happens is that the user has to give up custody of their funds to um, this central exchange, which conducts the trades on the user's behalf. The downside of this is that it can lead to, and has led to, a loss of user funds in many cases due to a variety of reasons, such as fraud on part of the exchange, security breaches, and just plain human error. Okay, but not all is bad about these exchanges. They are quite efficient. 
Um, basically, you don't have to go to the chain for every trade, so you, you don't incur the latency of, the, of your slow ledger. And you also get some sort of privacy because only the exchange really learns the details of most trades. All right, so, but this property of uh, this, uh, that you have to give up the custody of your assets is still quite problematic, and so people have come up with so-called decentralized or non-custodial exchanges. What happens in these is that users can retain custody of assets throughout the trading process, and so they're in charge, are, are responsible for their own funds. They don't have to rely on uh, trust in the centralized exchange in any way. Okay. But they have some problems, namely that every trade uh, requires an on-chain transaction, and this is quite inefficient. And this also leads to uh, a loss in privacy because if you don't have private transactions, then any observer can look at your transaction and see the details of the trade. Let's see why <clears throat> this is uh, problematic by looking at the limitations of DEXs in more detail. I won't focus on the efficiency or scalability aspect because uh, Ellie already covered techniques for that in his talk on Wednesday, and so I'll focus on privacy. So as I said, in a decentralized exchange, every trade goes on the ledger. And the transaction for this trade reveals the identities of the participating parties, what assets were involved, and what the values of these assets were. This is problematic because, first, it harms user financial privacy. The transaction history of uh, trading history of users is publicly visible on the ledger, and this reduces the fungibility of the user's funds and again, can also reveal things like trading secrets or trading techniques that the user might want to keep secret. Okay, this at a user level. But uh, this privacy, this lack of privacy is also harmful to the ecosystem of the DEX as a whole in that it enables front running. What this means is that when a miner sees, for example, a transaction that completes a trade, the miner can just drop that transaction and replace it with one in which it, the miner itself is a counterparty. And this can lead to some benefits in terms of uh, basically gouging money via price uh, information asymmetry. And it's not a theoretical vulnerability, the folks at IC3 have shown how that you can actually exploit this to uh, get a, a reasonable amount of money. Okay, so there's these real problems. Let's see how we can solve them. In this paper, we, in this talk, sorry, we'll begin by constructing private user-defined assets that have good anonymity. We'll show how you can trade these via private decks, and then we'll extend this to also, extend both of these techniques to also work with um, private stable coins that might have different policies than just uh, value conservation, as we'll see. Okay, so let's begin with private user-defined assets. Our starting point is the zero cash protocol, and we start off with this because it offers ideal privacy for users. When I make a payment to someone, the resulting transaction reveals no information about the consumed coins or the created coins or the identities of the participating, uh, of the sender and the receiver. And what it looks like is basically that each transaction consists of serial numbers for the spent coins and uh, commitments to the new coins. So neither of, the, neither of these reveal information about uh, the coins, but ensure that you can't double spend. And our privacy guarantees are basically the best that you can get because your anonymity set, or anonymity pool when you're creating a transaction is a set of all past coins. Okay, let's dive in in a bit more detail. So as I said, a zero cash transaction consists of serial numbers for the old coins and commitments for the new coins. What it also contains is a zero knowledge proof pie, which asserts some properties about um, both these old and new coins. About the old coins, it asserts that they correspond to some coin commitment that exists in the past. So basically, they're showing that the serial number corresponds to a coin that was created sometime in the past, and it does this via uh, a Merkle proof. It also shows that the serial number was computed correctly um, in a manner that's unlinkable with the original coin commitment. So the idea now is that even if somebody creates a coin for me in a transaction, they don't know when I spent it. Regarding the new coins, what it does, it just shows that the resulting commitment actually corresponds to some actual uh, coin. It's not just made up of garbage. <clears throat> and finally, it asserts that the input and output values are conserved, that we're not minting money out of thin air in a transaction. Right, this is cons conservation of value. Okay, so this is good. So far, Z uh, zero cash achieves ideal privacy for a single asset on a single blockchain. 
What we want to do is achieve ideal privacy for multiple user-defined assets running on the same blockchain. Now, a trivial way to do this would be to basically run, a parallel, uh, run an instance of zero cash for each user-defined asset in parallel on the same blockchain. But this is not really satisfactory because now your anonymity pool is split across the user-defined assets. So now, if your asset doesn't see much transaction volume, then you don't really get the benefit of much privacy. So what we want to construct is a system where each asset shares in the same anonymity pool. And let's see how to do this. The, our general idea is, our first step, is to generalize what the coin stores. It stores not only the value of the coin anymore, but also an asset identifier. And roughly what we can guarantee now inside the zero-knowledge proof is not just that for a single asset the value is conserved, but for every asset that participates in the transaction, the value is conserved for that asset. Now this discussion omits a bit of, uh, like omits how to actually mint the initial supply and generate the unique ID, but we know how to do this and the forthcoming update to the paper will, uh, you guys can read that if you want to see the details. Okay, so so far this gives us multiple private user-defined assets that share in the same anonymity pool and can even participate in the same transaction. So this is good, but the problem is that these assets are still really isolated. They don't interact in any meaningful manner, and this is problematic for applications that need this sort of interaction. For example, our DEX. So let's see how we can take this uh, basic construction and generalize it to work with um, such applications. What we do first is we extend our coin to hold not only the value and the identifier, but also some application-dependent data aux, which stands for auxiliary information. And next, we associate each um, coin with a so-called death predicate or consumption predicate. And the zero-knowledge proof enforces that for every coin that's spent in the transaction, the death predicate must be satisfied. You can think of this as like a private Bitcoin script. Um, Whenever you spend a transaction output in this case, you must satisfy the Bitcoin script, and similarly here, you must satisfy the death predicate of um, the coin. But the nice property that you get now is that no information is revealed about this death predicate. The transaction still only uh, reveals just what the serial number is and the commitment and nothing else. Okay. So let's see how we can use this protocol to construct atomic swaps in a private fashion. Now, why atomic swaps? Well, they're a Cree primitive for constructing DEXs. When you're trading with somebody, you don't want it to be the case that you send over your funds to that person, and then that person just disappears. So they have your money, and you're left with nothing, right? So let's see how we can construct um, a protocol for private atomic swaps. Let's say I have this coin C that has a specific ID and value, and I want to exchange it for another coin if, with a specified identifier and value. What I do is I make sure it has this exchange death predicate, and this enforces that my coin um, specifies what it should be exchanged for. In this case, my coin is saying, I want in exchange uh, ID star, V star, and it should be sent to public key PK star. All right, uh, the phi exchange then ensures that the other input coin has the correct identifier and value. It checks that the other input has identifier ID star and value V star. Next, it checks that the values are correctly swapped, the values and the identifiers are correctly swapped, and that um, the new coins are sent to the correct address. And this is all there's to it, it's not, it's not super complicated. I've omitted here the cancellation case, like when you want to cancel the trade, but it also can be ex is a simple extension of this, so it's not too complicated. Okay, so now for our DEX application, we've constructed our atomic swap. We've shown how, to, but, but we have these other things that we haven't talked about, namely, how do users create orders? How do users then discover these orders? And finally, having done both of these things, how do users go ahead and finalize the trade? So to do, to do these last three things, there's been a number of DEX architectures that have been proposed over the last few years, and I'll focus here on, uh, on two because these are what we uh, cover in the paper. The first is so-called order-based DEXs. In these, there's a central order book which maintains a list of orders that have been published by trade makers, the ones who bring the liquidity to the transaction, to the trade. And the order itself is just a tuple which reveals what the 
asset pairs are and what the values involved in the trade are, right? What traders can now do is they can go ahead and scan this order book and uh, see which orders are open. If they like any of them, they can go ahead and fill them. And examples of these and this um, process of scanning the orders and matching can be done automatically by the central order book or manually by the takers themselves. Examples of these DEXs include Radar Relay and IDEX. There's another class of uh, DEXs which I call index based DEX. And in these, there's a central party called an index, but it maintains instead of orders, so called intentions to trade. Now, these don't contain the exchange rate that you want the trade to go through at, but they just contain the asset pairs. Uh, the makers, again, publish these intentions to trade to the index. The takers can scan for open orders and fill them. But the process of filling these orders now requires interaction with the maker. We'll see how this works in just a second. Um, and examples of these include the AirSwap protocol. So in this talk, I'll focus on how to construct a private intent-based index, uh, index-based text. All right, so let's first look at a plain text version of these, a non-private version. For example, this is how AirSwap roughly works. So you have this index, and uh, it maintains a list of asset pairs that are involved in the trade, as well as public keys by which um, makers and takers can communicate. Let's say I'm a maker, and I want to trade, I have asset A, and I want to trade it for asset B. The taker, I publish this uh, listing to the index. The taker comes along, sees this uh, listing, and decides, I'm interested. Let's uh, try to negotiate with the maker. It uses the maker's encryption public key, interacts with the maker, and eventually, if they agree on the terms of the deal and stuff, the taker gets a transaction which completes an atomic swap. Right? You can take this transaction and, and publish it to the ledger that's completing the trade. Okay, so this is roughly how intent-based taxes work. Let's see what kind of privacy guarantees we get from these, or lack thereof. So if you have this transaction which is going to the ledger, what you can see is that there are these addresses for the maker and taker, and that the, the transaction is swapping VA units of some asset A for VB units of some other asset B. So we learn the identities of the transacting parties, and we learn which assets and values are used in the trade. Now these two kinds of leakage lead us to formulate two different notions of privacy. The first is so-called trade anonymity. And this is focused on hiding information about the maker and the taker. No information about the participants should be revealed to anybody. Okay, the second notion is of trade confidentiality and this focuses on hiding other aspects of the trade like the assets and values that are involved. Now these notions are useful because trade anonymity ensures um, user financial privacy by obfuscating the transaction graph, and trade confidentiality ensures or uh, prevents minor front running because the miners can no longer see details about the trade and so they don't know whether it's something that, should front, that they should front run at all. Okay, so these are useful notions. Let's see how we can realize them um, in our system. So we, let's try to construct a private intent, uh, in, intent or index-based DEX. So again, we have a maker who wants to make a trade. He publishes this listing on, on the index. The taker comes along, sees this, interacts with the maker via the public key. They agree on some exchange rate for their assets. And now here's where we introduce our uh, at atomic swap protocol. So the maker constructs his coin with um, which has asset A and value VA, and encodes in the application data that I want, as uh, in exchange for my coin, an asset of type B and value VB. All right, it sends over this coin along with the secret key used to redeem the coin to the taker. If the taker now has a corresponding coin of type B and value VB, uh, the taker can construct this private transaction which completes the atomic swap by satisfying phi exchange. All right. Once it's constructed this uh, transaction, it can publish to the ledger. And from this, we get both trade anonymity and trade confidentiality, because the transaction hides all information about uh, the maker and the taker in the transaction, and also hides all information about A, B, and V, A, and V, B. All right, so, so far, so good. We've constructed private user-defined assets. We've shown how we can enable custom access via Bitcoin-like scripts to these private user-defined assets. 
And we've shown how to use this ability to construct a private uh, decentralized exchange. Are we done? Well, not quite. So far, we've focused on very simple assets where the only policy that you're really enforcing is a policy of, um, I don't know, value conservation. But what if you wanted to support assets that had more complex policies? For example, there are stable coins which must enforce blacklists and whitelists on the, on the set of supported uh, transactions for compliance and regulatory reasons. How would you support these in our systems? Well, the key insight that we have is that there's two events associated with a coin. The point at which it's born, so when it's created, and the point at which it's consumed or which it dies. So, so far we have enforced some conditions. We have the death predicate when a coin is consumed, but we haven't really done anything when the coin is created. So what we do in our system now is enable this functionality to also be user-defined. So now each coin is associated not only with a death predicate, but also with a birth predicate. And users can use this birth predicate to enforce arbitrary conditions at the time of creation of the, of the coin. For example, you could enforce your old condition of value preservation, but also you could enforce some arbitrary policy is enforced when the coin is created. For example, it could be a whitelist or a blacklist. And the key thing to note here is that since the death predicate is left free, you're still uh, able to um, set it to be, for example, Phi Exchange, allowing, you, you to, uh, allowing this to be compatible with our previous examples like the private DEX. Okay. So in conclusion, what we've done is we have a system where you can construct private uh, user-defined assets, trade them via DEXs, and even enforce arbitrary policies on their transaction flow. But this is a bit of an ad hoc uh, system that's somehow customized to the specific application. What we do with Zexi is formalize this notion of how uh, coins, or in our case, records, which are units of data, should interact via applications by constructing a so-called rec records nanokernel. This is a minimalist shared uh, execution environment that defines the rules surrounding interaction of uh, these records. Next, we take this and we construct a cryptographic primitive called decentralized private computation that realizes a records nanokernel based on the ledger. And the nice property that we get is that the transactions reveal no information about any general computation occurring. So you, when you look at the ledger, all you see is opaque serial numbers and computation and commitments and nothing else. Finally, we take this uh, uh, theoretical crypto primitive and construct a system out of it. We leverage techniques from zero-knowledge SNARKs, from recursive composition of, the, of these SNARKs, and efficient circuit design to construct a system that can support um, arbitrary general computations quite efficiently. And the upside is that, yeah, you don't have, only the person who's conducting the computation has to pay the cost of the computation, and nobody else in the system has to pay that cost. Okay, uh, yeah, and that's it. Yeah, thanks for listening. Are there any questions? Also, is the speaker from Agoric here? Okay, great. Hi, great talk. Um, are there any measurements you'd be able to share about either the latency or the throughput of the systems that you get out of these primitives? Yeah, so this talk doesn't have the numbers, but on, on our paper online, you can see the link there, we have measurements for basically uh, how the core system should work. We don't measure how long, if you want to execute an application, how long that would take, but that can be measured via general, thing, uh, via general techniques. It just depends on the proof system that you're using. Uh, but for example, if you want to conduct a transaction with two inputs and two outputs, it roughly takes like eight second, uh, sorry, 80 seconds to create this transaction. Uh, and we see that this should, maybe the time should probably half in the future. And it's 80 seconds plus application time. So whatever application you're doing, there's some additional overhead from that. But that should not be too much. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for the question. <clears throat> All right, if no more questions, uh, let's thank the speaker again.